Sophie Shear is a renowned vocal coach in Nashville with clients from every genre. She's the daughter of a Christian music artist who was big in the 80s and 90s. She always knew she would sing and she started in childhood. By her late teens, she was coaching other vocalists. Now today, she has her own studio on Music Row and she coaches some pretty big names. But you may be surprised to learn that over the years, her coaching sessions have become less about singing and more about finding your voice. Now the process is something she describes as an excavation, really uncovering the real person and in turn their real power. It's incredible how much her voice coaching relates to the work we all do and that we need to do in discovering who we are. This is Sophie Shear, The Excavator. Tell me the best time in your life. Right now. Why? I am literally living the best time of my life. I'm, it's just amazing. I'm exactly where I feel like I need to be in life and just so much redemption has happened in my whole story and I'm just perfectly and totally satisfied with where I am right now. Oh my gosh, I yeah. love that. Yeah. I don't think there's a lot of people that can say that. You know? I know, I know, I, I think you're right. That feels very present, like you're living in the present moment. Mm -hmm. When was the worst time in your life? Oh, probably, probably the last two or three years of my first marriage. Um, gosh, every, every marriage, every failed marriage and in general, every good marriage has two sides, two stories. But I mean, I think it's, it's, it's most important for us to own what we have to bring to the story. And so I can't really speak to, I won't speak to what was going on on the other side, but I will say that I was an absolute mess. Multiple affairs, um, addicted to making people like uh, love me or you know get, get their attention. It was just, I was an absolute wreck. I, I was a shoplifter. I mean, just so many issues. It was unreal. And I basically chose within the last two or three years of that marriage, I just basically chose that I was not going to act like I was married anymore. So wow. yeah, it was just, I, I don't know exactly when that decision happened. I think it was a slow burn, but at some point along the way, I was just like, this is, I'm not happy. This is not right. But I, um, I, I didn't believe that I could get out of it. And so I was like, you know, if I can't get out of it, I'm stuck. Uh -huh. And so I was a raving lunatic. <laughs> oh my God. How old were you during that time? Two, three Well, years? let's see, two or three years, the last two or three years of what would have been a nine, almost a nine year marriage. I was in my mid to late twenties. Yeah. So. You felt like you had no choice and you just yeah. started doing that. Wow. Yeah. It was crazy. I, I grew up with a very um, religious mindset, and um, and so in my in my mind at the time, it would be worse to get divorced, and um, and and I I don't love divorce. I mean, I, having been divorced, um, my husband now has also been divorced once, and it's it's just it's ripping, it's crushing, it's just shred it shreds you. Yeah. But it was. It was one of those things where I, I thought, okay, it's going to make it worse if I do this. So basically, I just decided to live as though I wasn't married. I did not honor my husband. I didn't, I didn't have any respect for him. I didn't treat him with any just ounce of, I mean, it was just awful. And so everything about the legal signing of the document is it basically, in my opinion now, looking back, it's just to actually own up to what's yeah. already happened. It was inconsequential, you know I mean? right? I mean, you yeah. were already living a divorced life, yes, exactly. a single life. Wow. So. I, I got to tell you, I, there's, I rarely get surprised by what people say. That actually surprised <laughs> me. I had no idea that that was about to be part of your story. Yeah. So thank you, first of all, for telling yeah, me that. And, absolutely. And, and sharing that and then owning up to that because it's hard to tell yeah. The deepest, darkest. It's hard to say this was a terrible time in my life mm -hmm. and like actually put it out there. Yeah. Why? So and especially, you. especially when you feel like it was your actions that made partially made it the worst time. Like that's the thing about vulnerability. One of the most difficult things about being vulnerable is to own up when you've made a mistake. Like totally. that is the most vulnerable thing right there. And, and you can, you can be open in every other area, but if you cannot own up when you've mm -hmm. made a mistake, I think all of your relationships are going to struggle 
And you as a human, I think that's just, it's, you're setting yourself up for failure. Girl, oh my gosh. Keep it coming, keep it coming. Tell me, tell me when there was a turning point in your life where you say everything changed from that moment. Well, it's, uh, again, it might surprise you, but I, <laughs> God saved me. Actually, I grew up in, in church and in a, uh, in my, again, in my mind, a very just religious mindset and outlook on who God was. I always grew up with a, 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 an idea that I just had to check the boxes and do the right thing in order to be accepted by God or loved or anything and, or be worthy. And it wasn't until, you know, the, the hallmark of the Christian faith is that you aren't good enough. God is completely holy and, and perfect. And so nothing bad can exist in his, in his presence. And because you can't ever live up to that perfection, he gave his son, he gave the sacrifice so that all of Jesus's goodness could actually be applied to your account. And so now I had this revelation of, wait a second, I am good. He called me good. And therefore I am now empowered to live good to live as a much better person than I was before when I was so concerned about following the rules. About, you know? about being good. Yeah. yeah. When you tried to be good, you couldn't be good. It yes. was when you didn't try, yes. you just accepted the goodness. I accepted that he gave me that goodness and I actually received the, the, the supernatural power. And it's just, <laughs> everything is a whole new world. It's just so different. <laughs> it's amazing. And I, and now I don't live with this idea of, of condemnation, this, this constant tape playing that I'm a terrible person because I was, you know, <laughs> yeah. now I'm actually engaging with, uh, with a real being that I have conversations with. He tells me where to go, what to do, what to say to people. Like it's, it's real. I, I, I get to be a part of a mirror miracle every day. And that did not happen when I was just checking a list off and doing the religious thing. Right. So it's literally a whole new world. And that shift happened uh, when I was around 29, after I was divorced. And I, I was just kind of forced to reckon with myself. And I started going to this amazing church here in Nashville. And I was like, this is literally a whole new world. I actually yeah. got to know God for the first time. Did anyone say anything to you? Like, hey, you, you've made some really bad choices. Was was there ever a conversation with anyone else or was it solely a singular experience? Um, there were a few conversations with friends of mine and a counselor of mine, but they were they were all so gracious because you know the the, the kind of conversations I was used to growing up was you've done something bad, now go go, go punish yourself for decades for it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so, and, and then when I started to realize that's actually not reflective of the heart of God, like God is holy and perfect. And so nothing bad can afford to be around him. When, once I began to surround myself with, with people who also actually knew God, instead of just checking off a list of do's and don'ts, then the conversation started changing. Mm. And those people were so gracious and just most of, most of those conversations, they allowed me to be like, well, shoot, I really messed that up, you know? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, you probably did, yeah. but you know what? There's, there's grace for that. Let's come back where, where nothing bad is capable of existing. Let's, let's bring you back yeah. there. It, it was so different. Well, it changes your entire mindset, right? Yeah. And you operate from a totally different place yeah. at that point. Yeah. Wow. Uh, what's something about your nature you've overcome or maybe you continue to overcome? Um, I really, uh, again, thanks to the power of God in my life, I, I've been able to overcome the need to control people. It's, been something that's always been a part of my life until recently, but I always sought to control people and control outcomes of situations. Why? I think it's really out of self-protection. Um, I mean, I think that's probably, you know, all of us have, you know, painful situations, trauma, things that we've, you know, experienced in life. And so without, without really thinking, we've learned how to, <laughs> Can, you know, play the dice a certain way yeah. to like keep us from feeling that pain as much as possible. And so that was definitely born out of, out of pain. Wow. And now you continue to work on it, I imagine. Yes, for sure. Okay. So what do you find yourself saying a lot lately? Are there words that always come out of your mouth? I, 
I find myself more and more just speaking and repeating the promises of God to, from him to me. Um, because there, I think there's something like 7,127 or something, no, 9,000 maybe promises in the Bible from God to us. And so I find myself repeating them with my name and just like, like, wow, I'm feeling like no one cares about me or I'm at this party and I feel really alone. So I have two choices. I could like shrink back and become a hermit and give everyone the stink eye, or I could be like, wait a second. I'm okay because God promises that he's never going to leave me alone. So even if these people are actually ignoring me, which they probably aren't anyway, at least not intentionally, you know, then I'm going to be okay because he's got me. And okay, let's say I'm, I don't know, I, um, uh, I'm feeling under the weather. He actually promises to heal all my, heal all my diseases in Psalm 103. 103.3. So I'm like, you know what? I am well in Jesus name. I'm good. <laughs> Sophie, Sophie, yes, I am. Sophie yes, you are. Yes. Well. This is his provision for me. And so I just find myself repeating it. It's really amazing because when you, when you know the Holy Spirit, you know, he actually bring it. One of the, one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit, it says in the Bible is that he, he will bring to your remembrance everything that God has said. And so often, sometimes I'll even forget the promise that I need, or, I mean, I can't memorize 9,000 promises. So sometimes he'll just bring one to my remembrance that I didn't even know about. And I'm like, wait a second, is that in there? And then I'll go look it up. And it's sure enough, it's in the Bible, you know, <laughs> what would you say your purpose is right now? My purpose I believe my purpose is to, is to excavate people, like to, to pull out things that have been hiding that are in them because I was hiding for so long under this guise of just, you know, condemnation. And like, I can't be, I can't be what I want to be in life because I'm no good. And I think I just, you know, I, I teach singers for a living, but underneath that, there's always something, you know, underneath the physical physicality of the voice, there's something that has been preventing, you know, their voice from getting out or, or their very self from making it out into the world in, in, in a kind of an undiluted way. And so I, I believe that my purpose is to help people uncover those things and help them get to know who they are. And, and in turn, help them get to know God. I love telling people about Jesus too. <laughs> so when did you realize that, that that was your purpose? I, I think that is, I think there's not really a number one, mo like a, a moment that comes to mind. I think it's something that is always unfolding. It's an unfolding story when you I think even now, today I have a clearer view of my purposes than last week. And I definitely have a clearer view today than I did, you know, eight months ago, two years ago, three years ago. Mm. So let's talk about how you got into music in the first place. Yeah. Because you, you grew up in music and that was already so much a part of your life. Yes. My dad was actually a, um, a Christian recording artist back in the 80s and 90s. And so we moved here when I was two because he got a record deal. And so we moved from where my extended family lives in Louisiana and we've, I've been here ever since. So I'm, I consider myself a native Nashvilleian, which we're very rare. Yeah, you're, you're a unicorn. <laughs> yeah. We're, re I'm related to all the rest of them, <laughs> but I, I technically wasn't born here, but yeah. yeah. So it's kind of just been in the family and the blood. I, yeah. You know, I grew up singing on stage with my dad and I just, I just fell in love with it. Right. And so at what point do you remember thinking music is what I'm going to do too? Um, there was never, there was never a question about mm. whether or not it was going to be something I would, I was going to do. It just was. Yeah, it just was. And I, I've branched off and done a few different things, uh, over the course of my life, but they were all centered around music and the enjoyment of music, not necessarily the, the production of the creation of music, but the enjoyment of music and the living by music. I, yeah. I was a dancer as well. So just moving and enjoying the music and, and, I don't know. It's just, it's never been a question of whether it was always a question of just how or yeah. what it would look like. Yeah. So at, at what point did you say, I'm going to start coaching people. I'm going to teach people. So not only will I use the, the instrument and the artistry, but I'm going to teach others how to do it too. Mm. When was that? That was, I believe somewhere around 2008. How old were you? <laughs> I think I was 20. Gosh, how old am I now? Oh, yeah, I was 20, 21, 22, I think. Wow. Yeah. 
And so you decided to start coaching. What kind of people yeah. does a 21 year old coach? <laughs> um, <laughs> all, all different kinds of people, actually. Um, I, I mean, I had grown up, I had been, I'd started professionally singing in the studio, getting paid to sing when I was eight years old. So already, even at 21, the level of experience that I had far exceeded some people who were much older than me. Right. Um, and so I was, I was uh, fortunate to be able to speak into a lot of different kinds of yeah. people. But I taught all sorts of people, not very many uh, celebrities, <laughs> as in none. But at that time, <laughs> but um, but you know, I had to cut my teeth, and I had to get. I think the biggest thing I was learning then is how to read people mm. and how to uncover people, not just how to uncover their voice. Yeah, when you're 21 and you're you, you walk into, I mean, a room such as this maybe, and you're going to help somebody. Mm -hmm. Are you, as as a 21-year-old, thinking, I'm going to help them sing better? Or is a 21-year-old already thinking, I'm going to help them uncover? I mean, mm. well, get me into the mindset of a 21-year-old, a new coach. No, I, I was definitely not um, emotionally mature enough to to notice even that they were struggling emotionally or that the physical struggles actually stemmed from something deeper mm. and that it would prevent right i mean yeah. because now you know yeah. as a as a, an older coach a more mm -hmm. seasoned person yeah. in life and in and in uh, singing as well you yes. understand the connection explain the connection to me yeah. what all of us have that might prevent Mm -hmm. our voice from coming out. Yeah, um, one of the biggest lies, it's, it, it's just uh, literally, it's a list of lies. The way, that I, the way that I describe it is that there's, you know, there's the bedrock, there's the soil, and then there's the plant. And so the voice is the plant. What we hear physically, what I, you know, I sing, that's the plant that you hear. What you don't see is the soil below it, which is the emotional stories, the lies or the truths that I tell myself. And then the bedrock underneath it, who I am as a human. So, for instance, I had a student last week who, um, who it, just in life, he's struggling with this lie that he doesn't have anything to say. That he oh. doesn't have a message in life. He doesn't, people aren't going to listen to him. And so, physiologically, this, this plant that he was growing out of that soil was, I'm going to sing, but I'm going to sing like this. And it was like really rigid and enclosed. It was mm. like, it was like his voice was in there, but it was being encased because within. Him. It was in that lie, right? The lie that he didn't have anything to say. So that's the, that's the box he's going to fill. Yes. Oh, wow. And so during the lesson, I was just like, Hey, you know that you have something to say, right? Like if you're going to get up on stage, if, if, if someone has given you this opportunity, they've, they have seen the merit of you being on stage. They've seen that you have a story to tell. Why are you not owning that? And he just kind of like, it was like I sucker punched him. He was like, Phew. he texted me the, the, the week after that first lesson. He was like, look, I just want you to know, like me and my wife talked about this. And this was like a huge unlocking of something in my brain wow. and his singing changed. They said that weekend when they saw him up on stage, the people who knew him and loved him and heard him sing all the time, they were like, something is different. Wow. I have goosebumps because, <laughs> because th this is something so powerful that when, when you have a beautiful voice, when someone's already recognized, Hey, you, you have this power. Let, let's go out. Let's go out because your voice is powerful. They're seeing mm -hmm. the plant. Yes. But how does a person have a powerful plant, but terrible soil, terrible bedrock. Is that just a person who has a gift that doesn't know how to harness the gift or yeah. how would you explain it? Yeah. Um, that, that's someone who's been, been given a physical gift such as a basketball player being given the gift of height. You know, they could, they could not really know, uh, what it takes to be responsible with that gift yet. And of course, typically the younger they are, the less experienced they are, they don't have that. Right. Don't know how to take care of the body. Don't know how to yeah. right, eat for, you know, optimum performance. Yes. Any of that stuff. And even emotional care, like they don't know how to own what they do that no one else does. They're trying to compare mm. themselves to everyone else and be someone different. When, you know, a, a 35 year old singer can be like, this is me. Not everyone's going to like me, but <laughs> this is me. You know what I mean? We're a 21 year old person who's very gifted at singing. They could sound beautiful, but off stage, they're like, oh my gosh, but I didn't sound like Ariana Grande and I'm not going to get that record deal. And if I do get the record deal, they're going to take it away from me. And yeah, how do you, God, how do you even allow someone the space mm. to say, what is it that you do? How do we find that? Like, how do you handle that in a yeah. coaching session? I, I make them throw a lot of pasta at the wall. <laughs> That's what I say. 
Let's do uh, it. Well, how yeah. do we do that? But they Basically, if you take a handful of spaghetti, cooked spaghetti with no sauce on it, you throw it at the wall. Some of it sticks, some of it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> so I throw a ton of things at them. I make them uh, make weird sounds, weird noises. I make them sing songs that are really outside of their comfort zone. I make them sing songs that are in their comfort zone. And through that, uh, something starts to emerge and we go, wait a second. This is where you feel more at home. This is where you don't feel at home yet, but do you feel yourself kind of being swayed in that direction? How much do you, because I feel like what you're saying right now is I just picture you kind of holding a mirror. Yeah. You've listened to probably thousands of singers yeah. over the, the course of your life. Yeah, tens of thousands. And you can go, no one does that. Yeah. Here's the mirror, friend. Yes. No mm -hmm. one does that. Yeah. So let's focus on that. Mm -hmm. is it, do you feel like that's part of the process that you help them through? Yeah. Absolutely. Making them okay with the things that set them apart, that actually set them apart. Everyone's so darn afraid to be different. Yeah, I find that. I don't know why. Well, I mean, of course we know why. Like it's survival, right? As children, it's how we survive yeah. to, to just not yeah. stand out. And then as you get older, there's a part, I think, I know certainly for my, in my, in my own personal story, there's been a, a point in my journey where I've said, this isn't, this isn't my script. Mm. This isn't my story. What is my story? Let me find that. Yeah. And then I, I've been thinking of that, about that a lot with little children too. It's like, mm -hmm. let's find what, what makes you different. Don't do that. Just because yeah. your little friend in kindergarten did that. <laughs> that's not what you do. This is what you do. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's all, that's all based on, again, the plant, right? Allowing the plant to come out. Yeah. Let's talk about the excavation of those other things, getting mm -hmm. into the soil. Yeah. How do you do that? You ask a lot of questions. Rather, this is something that you're ex exceptional at. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that you, you just, you can tell someone, hey, you're doing this. And there's definitely moments where I say, look, you were pitchy on that section or whatever. You know, I'm going to give it to them straight. But, but there are other, other areas in life where you just have to, to ask the question, like, why do you find yourself doing that a lot? Hmm. What, what's up with this? Have you always done that? When did you notice that you started doing that? I asked one of my students that one time. I've noticed that you do this when you sing. When did you notice that you started doing that? And she thought for a second and she, she was just really quiet. And then she was like, oh my gosh, fourth grade. She was like, wow, I was, a, I was performing in my school talent show and I went out and people laughed at me. That's oh. when it started. And you trace it back. It's just, it's amazing. And, and she, she goes, wait a second, I'm not that fourth grader anymore, you know? I'm not, I'm not a little child, yeah. right? Like I'm an adult, I can People step aren't into... laughing anymore. <laughs> yeah, people want me to sing. They want that voice to come out. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Do you find, do you find that, you're, that you're uncovering in that way and, and pinpointing something that they don't even notice? Or, or is it 50-50? How often are people aware of the things that you yeah. bring up? That's a great question. Um, it's, I, I find it's really 50-50. Okay. There are some people who are absolutely just not even in tune with themselves at all. It, it completely shocks me, in fact. Wow. And, um, and I'm like, okay, I don't know if you're ready for this, but here we go. Here we go. And then there's other people that are like, yeah, I know that this happened and this happened and this is why I do this, but you know, I just need someone to help me. I, basically, there's people who need the nurturing hand holding experience, and then there's others who need a kick in the pants, and wow. they know that's what they need. Wow. So. I, th I just think about your role. I mean, I you don't need to tell me all of the people you've coached. I just know by <laughs> virtue of being in the music industry for as long as you've been, having a location on Music Row, being with people, I mean, in this business, in so many different genres of music, I can only imagine the people that you've worked with. Yeah. In, in the people that have more celebrity, shall we say, yeah. or more commercial success, the people that you've worked with, mm -hmm. has there ever been something that surprised you? Like, do you come into those kinds of situations expecting these people who've reached some pretty high heights do you have this expectation of what they're going to be? And does anything with that surprise mm. you? Yeah, two things. Um, number one, those people don't often, sometimes, but don't often get told uh, that they're not great. <laughs> so they're always told they're great. Pretty much. And then you might come in and be like, by the way, yeah. tap, 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 you're pitchy. Yeah. <laughs> Or, you know, tell, tell me more. Just because you've been singing that way doesn't, and you've made a career off of this sound, I want, I want to keep your sound because that is unique to you, but I want to protect and preserve your voice, which might require a slight 
change in, you know, uh, just a slightly altered kind of um, direction. And it's just uncomfortable for a lot of people. The, the more popular they are, the more well-known they are, they're like, well, no, this is my thing and I'm sticking to it, you know? And, and do you continue working with people like that or do you get yeah. through sometimes if, or no? If they'll have me, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll work with all sorts if they'll, if they'll have me, if they'll, if they'll participate in the, in the process. Not yeah. everyone is willing to do that. And because it's hard, it's, it's emotional. Yeah. It's, it's, um, vulnerable. It's, uh, y you get, you get exposed. It's uncomfortable. It's like, ugh. it's like being well, cold out of the shower. It's well, that's awful. The hard thing about, I, th I think that's the hard thing about, uh, music being an industry, right? Yeah. Because forever music was not yes. an industry. People sung, we would, you know, sing in, in, in churches. We would yep. sing as a community. We would get together yes. to celebrate. We'd sing, get together to mourn. We'd sing. Mm -hmm. And so now, I mean, in the last century, it's been monetized, yes. but but that that's so interesting mm -hmm. to me to hear to hear you say that that people would you know cling on to something and not mm -hmm. let go yeah. because music and singing that's expression that's yes. an art form so there yes. there does have to be some kind of inner excavation to be able to yes. to do that and to do that with with soul and to do that with power and mm -hmm. and with purpose yeah that, what's the other thing you notice about those celebrity clients? <laughs> the other thing that that I notice is that they are as insecure as any any one of us. Mm. They come in and you know when they I mean just because they're so and so does when they hear their song on the radio for the first time they still call their mom crying. They oh, still, you know, yeah, like you're right. they are still people who go I can't believe this is happening to me, like. And then they start to, you know, after a while they've been in it, they get a little bit more jaded, but <laughs> they, they are as concerned about pleasing their people that, that are fans of theirs and, mm. and, uh, uh, bringing the right message into life. And, you know, and they're yeah. as concerned with whether they did a good job, whether or not people are going to like them, whether or not they're going to maintain their record deal or mm. like they, they have, they have the a lot same, to, they have people thoughts. to please, yes. right? They have yes. so many people to please even which, more, <laughs> which I, yeah, probably even more. And their entire success hinges on that. And yeah. so then, oh, wow, that's, you know, that's a hard, that's a hard thought. You know, yeah. we like to put people like that on a pedestal yes. and say they have everything, mm -hmm. but they probably need the most excavation, yes. right? Yeah. Right. To they. get down past this beautiful plant. Right? Mm -hmm. And it has so to be, it has to be in a safe, private environment. That's one of the things that, you know, at my studio, we're very intentional about. Like you won't hear me talk a whole lot about who I work with because these people, they're, they're the same as any of us, the celebrities or, or just the everyday singers who are, you know, I don't know where they would sing on, you know, downtown, wherever on a corner. I don't care where they're going to sing. They're all singers in general still have to have a safe space where they're not going to be embarrassed. They can make any sound. They can, they can, their voice can crack. They can hit a pitchy note. They can start crying because of they realize that they were laughed at in fourth grade. Oh. And it's a safe place. Oh. And it, this is not going to leave this room. I'm not going to go off and start talking about what happened. You know, they yeah. they need that space to really find themselves and for it to be, okay, I'm going to find myself. Now I'm going to pick up all my selves and take them out and do something with them. <laughs> do you... I, I... I want to talk with you about anxiety. Yeah. Do you feel like that comes up a lot in, again, performance, in the voice, in that instrument? How often are you dealing with people who are dealing with anxiety? Yeah, quite often. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's it's really prevalent just for any, any person, any human, I think, in today's world. Um, and so one of the things that I just, I've been doing for myself recently is just getting off of social media. That's been so helpful, but, but you know, a lot of, a lot of people who are in the music industry, their part of their job as a musician is to stay relevant on social media. So that's a part, they clock in and they get on social media. That's what they have to do. And so, um, in addition to just the anxieties that come with performance, just their lifestyle feeds a lot of that. Um, it can be very dif difficult, very, very difficult. And, um, and I find that one of the most powerful things for people it, when it comes to specifically making noise, like physically with the plant, the out, the, the, the top level that we all see, they, they, most of them have just never been okay or been made to feel okay about making non-good sounds. <laughs> You know, like we do all manner of sounds in a lesson, you know, Give animal Give me an noise. example of what like. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> okay, let's take, for instance, if I'm going to try to sing a Whitney Houston song. 
which would be a tall order. I mean, like <laughs> she's like a once in a generation sound Keep going. True. Okay. So if I was going to try to sing, oh, I want to dance with somebody. Okay. So that was a great choice, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my faves, but I, I could, I could, I could try to sing that in my speaking voice, right? My speaking voice is like here, it's low, it's a deep, that's called chest voice. Mm -hmm. So if I go, oh, I'm kind of pulling up the first gear of my voice. So one of the exercises that we do to help them find the second or the third gear is the monkey noises. Ooh, 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 ah, 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 oh, I want to dance with somebody. And there it is. Oh, I love it. <laughs> but if someone is not comfortable making monkey noises, that note and that song is not going to come easily. Ooh, right. So there's this, okay. there's this thing of like, Oh, but that's a weird noise. <laughs> I don't want to do that. But you're a safe space. Exactly. But, so you have to get them to trust you a lot before they go and yeah. <laughs> be a monkey. Exactly. What's another animal sound that you do? Oh gosh. Um, may, well, maybe not an animal. We do a lot of cartoon ones too. We'll do Elmer Fudd. <laughs> you squirrely wabbit. <laughs> and that's like a Lauren Daigle. I keep fighting voices in my mind. There you go. Oh, <laughs> so, ha, I kind of wonder, have you ever met Lauren Daigle? And have you told yeah. her that you we go to you, church together? <laughs> have you told her, listen, when I teach clients, I compare you to Elmer Fudd. Yeah. I, I, need to, I need to tell her. That. You need to tell her that. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Man. That's amazing. An Elmer Fudd voice. <laughs> so funny. But you know what? Th that's interesting because just even hearing these kinds of comparisons, you took someone who was celebrated, who was so loved because of her own unique sound. Yeah. And you've actually compared her to something antithetical. I, I yeah. imagine that gets people laughing, right? It like does. In, in that And setting. it takes the pressure off of it, you know? Like, like one of the things we do in a lesson is before, you know, before I would ever sit down and have someone sing Whitney Houston, uh, unless they were Whitney Houston herself, mm -hmm. I would say, okay, let's, let's not, let's not go from here to here. Let's go from here to here. So let's do, ooh, 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 ah, ah, ah. And then let's go, you know, And they're like, oh, this is stupid. <laughs> but the stakes aren't as high because yeah. you're just making a monkey noise yeah. on a melody that you happen to be familiar with. So as soon as you bring in the lyrics, it's amazing, though. When you go, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, from that it, on the melody to the lyrics suddenly coming in, suddenly there's a story to tell. And everyone's like, okay, now for real. <clears throat> okay. How do I do it? And they just like <laughs> everything about this amazing, beautiful, natural, unfettered sound that came unfettered. I don't know. I don't know. Unfettered. Fettered. Okay. Close, close. <laughs> um, it, it just, it goes away as soon as they put, you know, it's, it's, it's more, it goes into hiding again. It's like, okay, now oh. I need to flip a switch into my performance mm. mode. And it's a different thing when the best performances come from that heart. Mm. They come from the uncoveredness of it, the, the exposure of it. Okay, you know? so let's take your metaphor a little further. So like if you've got the plant, you've got the soil and the bedrock, do you almost feel like you're taking your little spade and like digging <laughs> away some of the soil? Like, let's say, let me put some of my fertilizer in there. Like you yeah. are amazing. You can do this. Yep. Let me till a little bit. Look, yes. You are perfect in what you're doing and here's what you do well like are you that like yeah sounds so silly are you the fertilizer you are the <laughs> excavator you are you're the you're the gardener yeah. in that yeah. way yeah absolutely but um but no matter how good the gardener is you can't grow a plant if they don't want it to grow so there's a decision that it's a partnership I mean, this is one of the most, uh, probably most common misconceptions about a vocal coach is that they're going to do all the work for you, mm. is that they're going to give you the breakthroughs. I'm going to guide you to them, but you have to actually, you have to make the decision for yourself. Yes, that's a lie. I am, I'm going to choose not to believe that lie anymore. Right. And instead, you know, I do what I do. I'm like, wow, this is the lie I've been believing, but let me take one of my, my promises that I know that's real from God that I can go, oh, let me replace that. Let me, let me speak this truth over myself rather than, mm -hmm, you know, whatever it is the lie I've been believing. Good Lord. So, so you're like a, you're like a self-help coach. You're like any <laughs> good coach. I mean, that's what's so interesting to me about this. I think if someone would said, oh, okay, I've got this vocal coach here. This mm -hmm. is what the vocal coach does. Like you're saying, they're going to teach me all the best practices. It's yeah. all, it's going to be about craft, 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 yes. craft, craft. 
And I feel like so little of what you do is craft. <laughs> so much of oh, what you do is encouraged. It's, I mean, it is both. It's, I, I love the craft of it, especially because, you know, my, my singing method is a little different than what you find in, what, in other areas. What makes it different? Well, a, a large percentage of singers who have studied either in university or just on their own have studied a classical technique. So, um, and classical singing is beautiful. It's, it's yeah. an art form. It's gorgeous. But it is not the same technique as 99.9% .9 of singers who are singing pop, rock, country, R&B. Commercial whatever. sound, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, the, just it's not the, the, same. the soft palate, right? Is there a difference in like the shape of the mouth? Like, what there, there's the difference a lot is? of differences. It, for females, I would say the main difference is that you, like you, in, in classical, you're singing all in head voice, which is like, oh, right? Yeah. That's just completely head voice, one gear of your voice. It's like fifth gear. Um, in commercial music, you use first gear, which is my speaking voice. Hey, how you doing? I'm going to sing right here. Okay. <laughs> and then you also, what most singers don't realize is that there's an actual third register in between these two. So in classical music, it's like there's two registers for females. You can only use head voice. If you sing in chest voice, it's bad. Mm. So people switch, females particularly, there's a whole different thing for male, m male singers, but for female singers, it's like they come out of this, oh, and then they try to go, oh, I want to dance with somebody. And it's just like, <laughs> hold on, you need a different Ooh, tool for that a, job. It's an abomination for that song, but I, <laughs> I want the other tool. Yeah, tell me the other tool. So, so you have your chest voice, which is for your low notes. You have your head voice, which is for your high notes, but you actually have a second register that connects these two cavities yeah. in the back of your head. So in, in kind of the middle of your head. Think of it like the downstairs and the upstairs of your house. Okay. Most people are not using the staircase. So they're either tend to be stuck in the bottom or stuck in the top, or they have access to both, but it is a very rocky transition and mm. it's very obvious. That would be like, uh, <laughs> where it's very obvious. Yeah. Um, and so that middle cavity is actually called the pharynx. It's a real medical place term for the- P-H-A? Yeah, P-H-A-R-Y-N-X. Okay. The pharynx. So it's like if you had drainage, it would go from your nasal cavity down your pharynx into your mouth and you would cough it out. Gotcha, That's gotcha, where it's gotcha. going. So it's the staircase. So if I use the staircase, it's a, a smoother transition from bottom to top and it gives me that kind of commercial bite that mm. we love from the Lauren Daigles and the Whitney Houstons of the world, yeah. you know? So well, that's like- Pretty much any <laughs> female, any female that yeah. has commercial success figured yes. out how to use that. Somehow, yes. Whether they stumbled upon it or most of the time someone showed them. Someone showed me. I didn't stumble upon it, but it was, yeah, it, it's just a whole, it's a whole different thing. <laughs> so how do you find that? Do you start here? Yeah. So I always have people take their finger and just, ha, it's just really whiny. And then, ha. yep. And then once you find the Bugs Bunny, then you can kind of blend it in like an ingredient. If you're making a cake, your cake is flour, sugar, eggs, milk. Don't forget the butter. Eggs Good and butter. Lord. So, um, but you know, so it's one ingredient. You're never going to use just that thing unless you're doing a character voice or something. But you know, you blend it in. It's like, ha. But you blend it with ah, uh, ah, uh, and ooh, ooh, and then you have ah, uh, which is right in the middle. Which is so beautiful. Well Thank you. done. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's like you do this <laughs> I for do. a living, okay. for a living. When do you feel like you've had a breakthrough with someone? Like, mm. is there a particular thing that you get most proud of? Uh, I mean, I personally get really proud when they cry. <laughs> But no, okay, hold on. So tears are deep. Yeah. Tears aren't something you can just yeah. turn yeah. on. Tears are deep. So what do tears usually indicate? Um, usually they indicate one of two things, either that I've stumbled onto a place that they're not ready to go yet. So they're tears, but they're fighting them back. Mm. And I, and I, I, you know, I watch for body language. I'm, I'm a people reader. So yeah. if, if they're like, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> And I'm like, okay, you're not ready to go there. Yeah. That's fine Do you with me. say that or do you just kind of internalize it? Sometimes. Sometimes I internalize it. It depends on how comfortable they are, you know? Um, and, and then there's the type of tears where it's like, oh my gosh, I just had a breakthrough. I can't believe this. You know, yeah. and they're like, or, or they, they make a realization of a lie they've been believing or something. So those are kind of the, the, the flowing type of tears, <laughs> which wow. indicates a breakthrough. Do you hear a lot of, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm crying. I'm sorry. Yes. 
a ton. And are you like, girl, let it go. Yep. <laughs> yep. And that's, that's why I've, I've had to get so comfortable with myself because yeah. if I don't demonstrate that in a lesson, if I'm not making the weird sounds or getting choked up emotionally or, or going there, then they're not going to be comfortable to go there. Mm. Do you feel like you have to, in order to fill that space, do you feel like you have to give a lot of yourself? I want this person to go here in order to get them here. I am about to have to share something. Yeah. And so then you share because we know like in human communication, when I share, mm -hmm the expectations that you will also share. Do you yeah. find that you have to do that in the, that, yeah. you know, sort of space? Absolutely. Um, I have to be careful not to dominate the conversation because it really is their, their time. But when, when it's appropriate and when I believe it will be helpful, then yes, I'll, I'll share, you know, and, and sometimes it's not even so much sharing something. It's just, it's just raising the stupid factor. It's like, I'll be stupid. And then they're like, oh, okay, I guess it's not, it doesn't feel quite as stupid because you just did it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and that could apply to anything that they feel is stupid. Yeah. yeah. So. I imagine, in, I'm thinking, you know, just hearing your story, it would feel like the, the, the greatest victory would be to overcome a challenge for someone. And it's probably not even a challenge of the plant, the, art, the challenge of the artistry. It's probably yeah. a challenge of the soil yeah. and the bedrock. Yes. And I get super excited when there's been great breakthrough with the plant too. Like the, the physical things that shift in a, in a person's voice. It's amazing. I love it. I just geek out on it. You know, me and my, I have a whole team full of vocal coaches and we, we just sit and we'll talk about it for hours. I mean, we could just, it would just, it would be so mind numbing to anyone else, but, um, we love it. And, and yet the most exciting things that, that, that are a part of our lives as coaches is, yeah that they, they just believe something different about themselves. Yeah. They just overcame that thing. That lie, right? Gosh, yeah. I feel like I could go on and on with you. Is there anything else that you feel like is a misconception about what you do? Um, hmm. Well, I mean, I think there are some misconceptions that I would say are not true for this geographical location, um, but maybe, uh, N not misconceptions, say in LA, California, some somewhere else. Um, for instance, like if a vocal coach says you can sing, then you can really sing. So one of the misconceptions that I would say is here in, not true here in town as much is that your record label or your management or your people on your, on your team are getting their knowledge of how talented you are from the vocal coach. Hmm. They're, they, you know, sometimes even they've hired the vocal coach mm. and they are in close, you know, connection really? with you along the way. Okay. But typically this, the team already knows that they're talented, you know, yeah. like they, they were willing to put money behind them. They realized, wow, you've got something to say, whether you're a great songwriter or just a is, great story. Is that how you get hired most often by a label or, um, or is it sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes I get hired by a, a, a label or a management company. Um, or, you know, the, the artist's manager. Uh, sometimes they get hired by the artists themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then some of our students, you know, I, I work with different people than my team works with too, just because now my role has shifted a little bit as, as my coaching team has grown, my role has shifted more to managing them. But um, so we work with slightly different people. I, I only reserve a, a short, small amount of hours in the week for my students. But a lot of our students that work with all of us are brand new singers or just getting into the industry or haven't really discovered who they are yet, yeah. you know? So we work with all kinds. It's, it's really cool. Um, so, so at the end of all of it, I, when someone comes to you, no matter how they've come to you, not only do they have to be committed to the sound that they're going to create with you, mm. I feel like they have to have a commitment to self, right? Yes. Because like, if they're not going to uncover that, that's always going to stay hidden. And, yeah. and that's that's your role, right? That's the purpose exactly. for you. Excavate. Yeah. Well, and if you think about it, anyone in any role across the world, they have a story to tell and a group of people that needs to hear it. Not just would benefit from it, needs to hear it. Whether you're a singer, whether you're a vacuum cleaner salesman, what, no matter what you're doing in life, if you don't, if you don't make a commitment to yourself in, in really any, any endeavor that involves that storytelling, then the people on earth that you were meant to influence, 
they are at a loss. Hmm. You are at a loss and they are at a loss. Right. So it is much bigger than just you. Yeah. But wow. yes, you have to, you absolutely have to have a commitment to yourself. And this is why I don't work with everyone. I mean, I'll, I'll have a first lesson with just about anybody, but that doesn't mean I'm going to take you on as a, as a regular student, because if I don't see that ability, I'm just going to be spinning my wheels and I'll be frustrated and you'll be frustrated. Yeah. So, but I mean, everyone has a story to tell and you have to, you have to find out what it is or else a lot of things in your life are going to feel stuck. Yeah. And if you don't have the bravery to, to tell it. Right. Right. Because there's, there's your purpose. Mm -hmm. And then there are the people who are supposed to be impacted by your purpose. Yep. All of those people miss out if you yep. choose not to step into it. Yes. And we need, the world needs what you have to say. Now, even this podcast, this has just been such an inspiration for me too, because mm. you didn't, I mean, you're like, I don't even, I can't even explain it, but I know I need to do yeah, it. Yeah. Right now. This is what I got to do right now. Yeah. And, and those are, those are just the, the, the decisions that, you know, you, you put your time, sometimes you put your money, you put your efforts behind things. And there is no guarantee that there would be any, any return on your investment, except there always is. There always is. <laughs> right. When you're spirit led, right. Soul led when you make choices yep. from that place. Yep. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Sophie Shear, thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This is great. So what'd you think? Tell me in the comments below, like it, share it with someone who needs to hear it. I'm adding new videos all the time to help you reconnect with self and then prepare for purpose. And since you're here, I've gone ahead and linked my playlist, the episode Amplified. It gives shorter clips from each episode, still though very much power packed with encouragement. It's all right here. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.